Probably one of the most unique IPOs in the stock market history happened a couple weeks ago. FaceClan became the first esports entertainment company to go public at a valuation of $725 million with the motto, I miss the old face. Today is officially going to be a publicly traded company, but what I'm really excited for is that going public is going to give us the resources we need to get FaZe back to what it should be. I miss the old FaZe. So they're planning to use the funds from the IPO to bring the group back to its old days. But what does that even mean? Let's get one thing straight. Whatever they've done in the past has clearly worked for them really well. But they're no longer a private entity. They have far greater responsibilities to institutional and retail investors as a publicly traded company. Their CEO was recently quoted saying, We have been preparing for over a year to become a public company. In the meantime, we have announced our merger. We have put together a stellar management team and a world-class board of directors to oversee the company. Here is Jack Ma, the man behind the world's biggest IPO back in 2014, making a public statement that he wishes he never took Alibaba public. He highlighted that by going public, his company is under much more scrutiny from investors, regulators and the media as they are now the center of attention. And there are many other CEOs that made similar public statements sharing their regrets for listing their companies public. So despite all this, why did FaceClan go public and what could it mean for the company's future? Let's find out. FaceClan began as a YouTube channel where friends shared viral clips performing trick shots in video games such as Call of Duty. Within two years, the group evolved into a media empire by expanding their roster with popular content creators and professional gamers. Today, the company has a combined social media reach in excess of 500 million followers across all social media platforms. FaceClan's business model rides and dies on the back of the influence and reach of their talent roster. As the group originated as an esports company, some believe that their major revenue segment is via competitive gaming. Although FaZe has invested in the world of competitive gaming with 11 sports teams that won a total of 35 championships worldwide, unfortunately as a new industry, esports earnings are far lower than traditional sports tournaments. In fact, the company's total earnings from competitive gaming tournaments in the past 12 years is only $13.5 million. Clearly winning tournaments and having popular gamers among the ranks is not enough to establish a $100 million plus company. In order to drive some sort of stable and predictable earnings into the future, the company's business model is becoming far more complex. So much so that in their latest investor presentation, they have highlighted that one of their main monetization strategies is to introduce gambling to their 500 million fans. Where in the same presentation, they have also highlighted that 80% of their audience is between the ages of 13 and 34. The key to understand how the new phase, or as they like to call it, the old phase operates, is through sponsorships and other brand deals, which represented roughly 50% of their $53 million revenue they've made last year, while streaming revenues were at 30 and merch sales and e-gaming stood equally at 10% each. In the modern click-based society, the more eyeballs an entity receives, the better. With over 500 million followers, FaceClan has clearly done a great job. The next step for the company is to define an optimal strategy to monetize these views. In their presentation, they mentioned that they expect Gen Z to have an estimated global income of $33 trillion by 2030. They're clearly holding a pocket full of aces and are well positioned to take advantage of this huge opportunity. Yet despite having the best hand, you still need to play the game to win. So far, the company prides itself with the lack of professionalism and old-school job titles. Their corporate culture is dominated by the big personalities of its founding members, which have contributed to a lot of the controversies and internal volatility. One former employee said that kids with no experience in running business or branding are calling the shots and describing the organization as a shit show. Apparently, key team members like Face Banks play a large part in the company's business dealings. Last year, FACE signed a multi-series sponsorship deal with McDonald's with the social message of diversity and inclusion, stating that the collab is designed to bring awareness towards diversity within the gaming industry. They have emphasized that with this initiative, they're looking to make a lasting impact. But maybe they should start first by making an impact within their own roster, as they have only one female out of 80 members. They also have less contradictory sponsorship deals and collabs with brands like Manchester City, the NFL and General Mills. In their latest SEC filing, FACE highlighted that its stock price will be affected by the reach, viewing, content collaboration and sponsorship deals. 
which makes a lot of sense considering their business model and revenue drivers. In the following paragraph, they've stated that if the company cannot maintain or improve the brand, it may not be able to sell products or services, and consecutively, consumer participation may decrease, which could have a negative impact on its financial position. Now, there is quite a difference between how public and private market investors would perceive this piece of information. On the private side, angel investors alongside venture capital funds are much more patient with bottom line losses and poor cash flows as long as the larger market potential is still there. Whereas on the public side, investors will be less tolerant towards a company that has not reached profitability in 12 years, especially if they don't hold any intellectual property and burn through cash like there is no tomorrow let alone if their future revenues are based on quite uncertain factors, such as the popularity of their roster and the assumption that they will not be involved in controversies that might impact their ability to attract new sponsors. Which probably explains why there are not many publicly traded media companies whose business models are based on sponsorship deals rather than tangible products or services. In their investor presentation, FaceClan also draws a few parallels to traditional sports teams, which from a business model perspective are not too different than esports organizations. Despite some regulations and rules against traditional sports teams to go public, globally there are only a handful of high-end professional sports teams that are publicly traded, simply because a sports team will always be more valuable to a rich individual than a traditional equity investor who only cares about the company's cash flows. Essentially being a part owner or investing in these sports teams is a bit of a vanity investment. The investment rationale is not purely driven by logic, but in part emotional. Among all the big football clubs, only Manchester United, Juventus and Dortmund are publicly listed. And when you look into their stock performance, you realize why this is not becoming a trend. Manchester United returned 0% to its investors since 2013 while Juve had quite the run-up with Cristiano Ronaldo joining the club, which increased the company's value by two and a half times in the matter of a year, once the rumors of his departure started, till the day he left, the stock literally plummeted 70% from its peak. This is a great example that illustrates how fragile and subjective the valuation of these organizations can be. Compared to a traditional business, there are many more variables that are not necessarily in the control of these teams. Just like Cristiano's departure, Juve couldn't stop him from leaving, which significantly impacted their brand value. The same can be said for FaceClan. Their most valuable asset is their subjective brand power. Each team member has the name Face in front of their nickname, which often guarantees a spike in popularity after a new member joins the team. However, Face Clan's reliance on public perception and sponsorship deals clashes with its ethos as an edgy and often controversial organization. But according to Dan Shribman, who is a board member of Face as well as the CEO of their spec advisor, B. Riley Securities, that's not much of a problem. Quote unquote, he describes the organization as it's edgy, deep in the youth and gaming culture, and that's what makes it what it is. If there were no controversies, that would be pretty boring. And the headlines Face Clan has been making are certainly far from boring. Last year alone, the company was involved in controversies surrounding racist slurs, sexist jokes about women in esports, and probably the most publicized scandal of all was the crypto pump and dump scandal, which resulted in their key member Face K getting kicked out and three other members suspended. That's not a first though. Almost every year, there are numerous controversies the group is involved in. In 2020, Face co-owner Ricky Banks advertised a site for gambling with video game items without disclosing that he was the owner. The following year, he was also generously compensated to fly to Mexico to promote an offshore crypto gambling website. Popular Fortnite streamer Tifu also sued Face Clan over what his lawyer described as an exploitative contract, which ultimately settled later that year for an undisclosed amount. And as Shribman described, these controversies are part of FaceClan's culture and to an extent contribute to their hype. The question comes down to how Wall Street and the larger financial community will be handling these controversies going forward. Probably the most important piece of information that came out of FaceClan's IPO announcement was the rate at which the company has been burning cash. Prior to the IPO, the company had only $43,000 in the bank. Bear in mind that no esports organization has been able to raise as much as capital from the private markets as much as FaZe did, which is around $110 million, of which $40 million was raised two years ago from investors including influential names such as rappers Pitbull, Ray J and Lil Yachty, and basketball players such as NBA All-Star Ben Simmons, and even LeBron James' son LeBron Jr. 
During the same time, they've also received a $2 million PPP COVID loan from the government, which doesn't make much sense considering their business model is based on streaming from home. Remember they had made $53 million in revenue in 2021? Well, from that figure, they managed to make a net loss of $36.9 million, and that's not a first. The previous year, they had lost $28.8 and the one before that, $31.1 million, which brings their total burn rate to $99 million in the last three years. Keep in mind that FaZe is not developing cutting-edge technology nor curing cancer. But since they went public with a spec deal, in other words, merged with the blank sheet company, their financial statements do not provide much further detail to their losses. But one striking detail is the compensation of the company's executives. Last year, the company's CEO, Lee Trink, received a total of $1.38 million, which is nowhere close to what the company's chief strategy officer, Kai Henry, made at $2.1 million. After the announcement that the company's 2021 performance deviated significantly from their initial forecast, their $1 billion IPO valuation had to be revised down to $713 million. Beyond FaceClan's failure to hit its 2021 target, the company also expects its 2022 results and forward to be materially different from what they had originally predicted, mostly due to the higher cost of revenue and admin expenses, as well as a decrease in top-line revenue by 20%. For the time being, they've raised enough funds to stay afloat for a couple more years. However, as polarizing the group is within the gaming community, it has also started to show some meme stock-like behavior from its first day of trading. The following week, it experienced a short squeeze pushing the stock to almost double its IPO price, which ultimately crashed down 40% from its peak, settling down at $13 a share. This market price roller coaster could potentially hurt the company's finances, as it could jeopardize their ability to raise additional capital if needed. FaceClan remaining a private company could have potentially been a better scenario for the organization's future. But for now, it seems like their only way out is to exceed the pre-announced revenue projections and raise significant amount of capital in the meantime. If you made it this far, welcome to Financial Interest. We make videos on interesting financial topics. If you had a good time and learned something new, I would highly recommend you to check out our previous videos. To support the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. And I'll see you all next week.